Nübüvvet, hakikat arayışında peygamber ışığı. Selamun Aleyküm ve Rahmetullahi ve Berekatuhu. Um, I will, because of lack of time, I will proceed and read from parts of my, my paper. Now, my topic is prophethood, the Ahl al-Bayt, and the ideal of excellence in Nursi's thought. Now, basically, my, my point is a very simple point, that to love the Ahl al-Bayt is to emulate them, to follow them, and to emulate them means to follow their struggle for the truth and their struggle against injustice. The thesis of this paper is that the role of prophethood for Nursi is expressed not only through the person of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, but also via the family of the Prophet or the Ahlul Bayt. The paper my paper applies a framework derived from Nursi's approach to the problem of evil to examine the role of the Ahl al-Bayt in spiritual struggle and progress. Now the significance of uh, the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, is given by the well-known tradition, the Hadith al thaqalain which refers to the two weighty things that the Holy Prophet said he was leaving behind, that is the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt. The Prophet is reported to have said that the Muslim world would not go astray if, if they strictly adhered to these two weighty things. The role of prophethood in humanity is manifested in various ways, including through what the Prophet bequeathed, that is, the Ahl al-Bayt. So my paper focuses on the significance of prophethood in terms of... Um, in terms of the function of the Ahl al-Bayt as a prophetic legacy. And in my paper, I give specific attention to two members of the Ahl al-Bayt, that is uh, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, karamallahu wajhu, and to Sayyidina Hussein alayhi salam. Now, the, the framework, of course, is Nursi's approach to the problem of, of evil. We can understand the significance of the role of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein by understanding or appreciating the role of evil as seen um, in the works of, of Nursi. Now, Nursi had his own approach to the problem of evil. This approach is founded on the idea of beauty. Nursi said that underlying the things and events of the universe that appear to be ugly is an aspect of true beauty. According to Nursi, God deliberately veils the underlying beauty of events that appear to be ugly. So the world is an arena of trial and examination. It is a place of striving in which humans are accountable for their actions. But examination and accountability require that reality remains veiled. If all was revealed, there would be no need of striving in the path of spiritual progress. It is because reality was veiled that humans exerted themselves through competition and striving. As Professor Saritoprak noted, the purpose of the veiling is to test, is a test to differentiate between those who follow the path of the prophets and those who follow the path of tyrants. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Abu Jahal are two historical characters referred to by Nursi to represent these two paths. Nursi is referring to the function of the ugly. If those who were innocent never encountered difficulties, did not suffer and remain untouched by calamities and disasters, there would be no differentiation between the just and the tyrannical. If the Abu Jahls of the world saw that the innocent were untouched by calamities, there would be no reason for them not to submit like um, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. As Nursi explains, Abu Jahal, the accursed, and Abu Bakr, the truthful, would appear to be equal, and the mystery of examination set by God would be lost. Nursi gives the, you know, the, the analogy of coal. You know, coal 
would have had the value of diamonds and no purpose would have remained for testing and accountability. So this is the basic framework uh, derived from, uh, from Nursi. Now, the, the function of the Ahlul Bayt is the embodiment of what we can call the ideal of excellence. Now what do I mean by the ideal of excellence? The ideal of excellence is a notion developed by my late father, Professor Said Hussein al -Attas. The ideal of excellence is defined as the conception of a decent, just and dignified life for people. Um, if we look around the Muslim world today and indeed much of the, the third world, we see that um, we have this conception or we have the reality of uh, the reality of a decent, just and dignified life is, uh, well, it is not a reality in other words. It is a conception that is not realized um, when you look at the reality of uh, economic, political uh, and cultural life in uh, the Muslim world. Anyone who claims that we do have a just, dignified life in uh, much of the Muslim world is probably uh, blind or um, living in an illusion. What do we see instead? We see misery, backwardness, exploitation, ignorance, disrespect for the dignity of the human individual. If the ideal of excellence was widespread, it would result in the hatred for corruption, the hatred for social injustice, for disease, poverty, hunger, ignorance, the loss of self-respect, and all other ills of social life. So the ideal of excellence is an all-encompassing outlook on life that has as its objective a society of excellence. It is the motive force behind great efforts to achieve such, uh, to, to achieve a good life. Now, with respect to the characteristics of leadership, the, the Dutch historian Johan Huizinga discussed the historical ideals of life. Now the historical ideals of life is the ideal of excellence that is projected onto the past. And I'm not going to spend too much time discussing this. Uh, there's one point in this connection that I want to make that all great leaders had a notion of great leadership of past leaders that they wanted to emulate. In other words, they had an historical ideal of life. They looked to past leaders as ideals of excellence. Uh, and there are many studies in the case of European uh, history uh, which show how certain leaders in European history had historical ideals of, ideals of life. They looked at leaders of the past as embodying certain ideals of, um, of excellence. Now our question is this, my question is this, are members of the Ahl al-Bayt, in, in, in this case uh, Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein, are, the, are they the historical ideals of life for our contemporary leaders? So of course this leads to the question of what are the ideals of excellence that are to be found in the characters, in the personalities of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein. Nursi regarded the Ahl al-Bayt as examples to be followed in order that people would adhere to the prophetic path. In other words, Nursi considered the Ahl al-Bayt as the historical ideals of life. The traits of their characters constitute the ideals of excellence. And I'm, let, let me gi just give some examples of um, what ideals of excellence Nursi saw in Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein. For example, um, may I ask some of the, I, I, it's a bit difficult for me to concentrate when the, the participants are speaking very loudly. You might, the translators may, may just mention that. Nursi's interpretation of the conflict between Ali and Muawiyah at the Battle of Sfin starts from the conventional view. The conventional view can be seen in Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun's, in Ibn Khaldun's account, the conflict, the conflict between the two arose as a natural consequence of the draw of group feeling or asabiyah. 
both sides were guided by the truth and by independent judgment or ijtihad as to where the truth lay. Neither fought for worldly or personal gain. Although Ali was right, Muawiyah did not have bad intentions. He sought the truth but missed it. Both Ali and Muawiyah were in the right, according to Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun here takes a stance of neutrality between Ali and Muawiyah and may be said to have exaggerated the correctness of Muawiyah. This is in contrast to the position taken by Nursi who regarded Muawiyah as having fallen into error. In view of the historical facts, we would be inclined to take the view of Nursi rather than Muawiyah, uh, rather than Ibn Khaldun. It is indeed difficult to take a position of neutrality between Sayyidina Ali and Muawiyah. In Nursi's view, Ali was correct in the conflicts that he entered into because he upheld what Nursi called pure justice. Nursi discusses this in connection with the conflict between Ali on the one hand and Talha, Zubair and Aisha on the other. This was a struggle between pure justice and relative justice. I quote from Nursi, Ali took pure justice as fundamental and in accordance with his judgment of the law, proceeded on that basis, as was the case in the time of the caliphs Abu Bakr and Omar. Those who opposed him, those who opposed Ali, said at that time, the purity of Islam permitted pure justice, but since the passage of time, various peoples whose Islam was weak had entered Islamic social life. Therefore, to apply pure justice was extremely difficult. For this reason, their judgment of the law was to proceed on the basis of relative justice, which they regarded as the lesser of two evils. Dispute over the interpretation of the law led to war. So, uh, Nursi is making the distinction between pure justice and relative justice and, and, and said that Sayyidina Ali upheld the notion of pure justice whereas those who opposed him upheld a notion of relative justice. Um, when it comes to, to uh, the conflict between Sayyidina Hussein and Yazid, Nursi said that Hussein took the bonds of religion as the basis and struggled against them as someone who executes justice until he attained the rank of martyrdom. As a matter of principle, Hussein was opposed to Umayyad rule because of its very basis. The struggle between Hussein and the Umayyads was one between religion and nationalism. The Umayyads established their state on the basis of an Arab nationalism and put the bonds of nationalism before those of religion. And according to Nursi, this led to, to, to tyranny. Now, for, for those who would adopt religion, placing religion above nationalism and the preparedness to suffer and die for one's principles. This can be considered as the most important dimension of the ideal of excellence, the willingness to sacrifice. How can we understand the role of the ideals of excellence <clears throat> and the opposite of the ideals of excellence the ideals of decadence or malevolence. How can we understand, therefore, the role of spiritual progr progress and evil in a world where everything is created by God? As stated, as I stated at the beginning, uh, Nursi's view, Nursi saw the two, uh, spiritual progress and evil, the ideals of excellence and the ideals of decadence, as integral to the struggle for truth. In the course of human striving and competition, there are those who chose the path of the Prophet whose historical ideals of life were based on the Ahlul Bayt, whose ideals of excellence were informed by personalities such as Imam Ali and Imam Hussein. In Nursi's approach, there is beauty underlying the ugly. <clears throat> In leadership, the beauty is manifested only if the ideals of excellence triumph over the ideals of malevolence or the ideals of decadence, as we saw in the case of Ali and Hussein. This does not mean that Ali and Hussein had to succeed in their this-worldly endeavors, but their conduct had to be such that history would judge them as having followed the path of, stru of truth and spiritual progress. Ali's virtue was that, according to Nursi, 
he was worthier of important duties than other than politics and rule. Had he been a complete success in government and politics, he would not have attained a spiritual role that continued long after his caliphate and his leaving this world. The ugliness experienced by Ali and his supporters reveal the underlying beauty of his role and mission. The, name, the same is true of Hussein. His experience of the trials and, tri and tribulations of politics caused him to lose attachment to the world. Instead of becoming a commonplace caliph, <coughs> caliph let me repeat that, instead of becoming a commonplace caliph, he became one of the spiritual poles among the saints. It is crucial, I would like to conclude, it is crucial that society today takes heed of Nursi's advice that the Prophet, as well as members of the prophetic household, the Ahl al-Bayt, should be taken seriously as historical ideals of life, who can inspire us with the ideals of excellence and in turn cause us to exert pressure on our leaders to adopt such ideals. There is a salutation, a salawat, to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and to those who trace their descent to him. As-salatu um, salam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Nabil Mahbub wa ala alihi wa man ilayhi al-mansub. Now this part, wa man ilayhi al-mansub, refers to those who consider, who, who trace their descent to the Prophet, not only in terms of their nasab or their bloodline, but also in terms of their way of life. In other words, in other words all Muslims should consider, consider ourselves mansub, descendant of the Prophet in terms of the way of life. Now, if that is the case, we should consider ourselves also as mansub or descendants of the way of life of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein, not just the Prophet, but also the, the Ahl al-Bayt. And that means emulating the ideals of excellence of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Hussein and not emulating the ideals of decadence and malevolence of those whom, who oppose them. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Istanbul İlim ve Kültür Vakfı